Okay, so um, our the camera that I've been using not working very well. It's having some battery issues, so use uh, using the laptop today, so the quality <coughs> will be a little lower than normal. But that's all right. The audio should still come through. Okay, so we have got our farm day. Yay! Right, everybody loves pharmacology. Uh, so we'll focus a lot on the cardiovascular pharmacology. Uh, just a couple of uh, things that I didn't specifically cover yesterday that I want to throw out. Um, talking about congestive heart failure management. There is kind of a, a, an emerging trend, a, a new class, not a new class, but a class of medications that seems to have some pretty significant efficacy, depending on the data that you look at in uh, managing CHF patients, and there are actually services that are administering this class, and these are the, the ACE inhibitors. Okay, so uh, what are some examples of some ACE inhibitors? <coughs> so you guys uh, remember talking about the ACE inhibitors in pharmacology? What are they? What does that stand for? Angiotensin converting enzyme. Okay, so angiotensin converting in enzyme inhibitors. And so did Ed talk to you guys about the renin angiotensin aldosterone cascade yes. in pathophys? Yes. Very, very important system. Uh, we'll talk about it in even more detail in uh, your med blocks when we talk about the, uh, the renal system. But basically what happens is you look at your kidney. If your kidney senses that the per its perfusion is decreasing, it will excrete a hormone called renin in response to that, that decreased perfusion. Okay. Uh, renin then causes the release of another hormone called angiotensin, specifically angiotensin 1. Now, angiotensin 1 is it, the inactive form of angiotensin, right? Mm -hmm. And angiotensin 1 is actually circulated through the lungs, and there are enzymes in the lungs, angiotensin converting enzymes, how about that, right? <laughs> And that will convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Right. And what does angiotensin 2 do? What does angio mean? What does angio mean? Angio. When you guys are doing IVs, you are using an angio catheter, right? What does angio mean? Yes. Vessel, yeah, going into a vessel. What's tension mean? Tension. To make tense, so it literally means tense vessels. So it causes vasoconstriction, right? And that increases systemic vascular resistance and can increase blood pressure. Angiotensin II also um, is related in the release of yet another hormone called aldosterone. And aldosterone causes us to hold on to sodium. And when we hold on to sodium, what else do we hold on to? Water. Water, right? Yeah, you guys got that. So the, the net effect of all this is blood vessels that are constricting, holding on to water. And hopefully what happens is that will cause an increase in blood pressure an increase in mean arterial pressure and an increase in renal perfusion. And the kidney will become perfused better, the kidney will be happy, and then once it gets happy, it'll quit releasing renin, okay, and then this system kind of shuts itself off until it's needed another time. That's that whole negative feedback loop. Um, so angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors work on the ACE enzyme in the lungs and they prevent angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 conversion. And so what that does is that can cause some vasodilation and that can cause us to lose a little, little water as a diuretic-like effect. 
and um, that can ultimately decrease blood pressure, right? These are very common blood pressure medications. Um, specifically, these are good medications for managing blood pressure when I don't want to impact the heart rate. Because if I give you, say, a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, they're, they're depending on the, well, specifically calcium channel blockers, um, or beta blockers, rather, um, well, both, depending on the type, uh, can really hit the heart and decrease that heart rate. But if, let's say you want to manage blood pressure without impacting heart rate, um, an, an ACE inhibitor might be a really good option. Um, say someone like me, I'm a pretty active guy, um, I need my heart rate to kick up when I'm active, right? Um, so if I have hypertension, um, perhaps an ACE inhibitor would be a better option for someone like me. Um, whereas if I was on a, a big dose of a beta blocker, my heart might not be able to respond to exercise as well as it could. Okay, but ACE inhibitors appear to have a very important role in managing congestive heart failure, even acute manifestations of CHF, giving uh, a dose of a, an ACE inhibitor out in the field. Um, and there are actually services that do this, so I just wanted to mention that. And you guys should be able to recognize common ACE inhibitors. I'm not going to expect you to memorize doses or anything, but you should know what common ACE inhibitors are. Anybody? Okay, yeah, so these tend to end with PRIL, pril. So lisinopril, lisinopril, inelopril, captopril. All right, these are all examples of ACE inhibitors. You guys okay with that? Okay, so I just wanted to mention that as well. Okay, um, let's quickly talk about the nitrates. Uh, are nitrates medications that we give commonly? That you give what? Commonly. Are they commonly administered by paramedics? Nitrates. Yes. Why? What makes you say yes? Because I'm guessing that nitroglycerin is a nitrate. Yep, you're right. So let's talk about nitrates real quick. So nitrates are a group of medications. Okay. Nitroglycerin happens to be an example of a nitrate. Okay. Uh, one of the most common nitrates that we administer, in fact. And nitrates, their mechanism of action ultimately revolves around increasing levels of a substance known as nitric oxide. And nitric oxide has very potent vasodilatory effects. And so this tends to be the uh, major mechanism of action of your nitrates, or the basic mechanism of action is this. Uh, their ability to uh, mediate or modulate nitric oxide, the nitric oxide system, um, very potent uh, when looking at your blood vessels, of course. Um, so nitroglycerin happens to be one. Let's go ahead and quickly talk about another one that is less commonly encountered but it's still very important because there's some very important things that you need to know about this. Okay, and this is a medication that is uh, given typically as a drip. Okay, and it's something known as sodium nitroprusside. You guys ever heard of that? Sodium nitroprusside or nitride is a, um, a uh, trade name, I believe, for sodium nitroprusside. Did you get nitride? Nitride drip, yeah. Sodium nitroprusside. Right? Nitride is the trade. Sodium nit nitroprusside is generic. If you're going to focus on names, focus on generic names. They tend not to use trade names in, on exams. Okay. Um, that also follows for equipment as well. Okay. Uh, you, you'll see there's a tendency to 
to not necessarily say a certain like King LT. They'll say a they'll say a single lumen supraglottic airway or something like that. We'll, we'll get to that terminology when we get there. Sodium nitroprusside is also nitrate. It's a very potent nitrate. Very potent. Okay, very good at causing vasodilation, very good at manipulating blood pressure. Okay, so we often will see sodium nitroprusside used in situations where I need to have very tight control of somebody's blood pressure. Um, for example, if somebody has a aortic dissection, something we haven't talked about yet. Okay, one of the things when it comes to managing an aortic dissection is actually preventing hypertension, okay? And we actually may do that by putting somebody on a nitrite drip and then titrating it to keep their blood pressure um, down a little low uh, for reasons that we'll, we'll talk about when we get there. Okay, that's sodium nitroprusside. Now, some things you wanna know about sodium nitroprusside, it breaks down rather robustly in light. So when you mix it, it actually comes with a, a, almost a, like an aluminum foil blanket if you will, and you have to put that around the IV bag when, when you mix the nitride um, to protect it from light. So that's the first thing. The second thing that you need to know about sodium nitroprusside is sodium nitroprusside is metabolized, obviously, in the body, as, as most drugs are. And their a metabolite of sodium nitroprusside is of a cyanide-like um, metabolite. So there is a risk of cyanide toxicity, particularly at higher doses. All right, so for having to give high doses of sodium nitroprusside, cyanide toxicity is something that we need to uh, be on the lookout for. How does the body clear it? What's that? How does the body, um, what's the process for clearing the body of the medication? Where does it, does it process through the kidneys? Well, in general, most, most just, just general pharmacology, most of your metabolism is the liver, most of your elimination is the, the kidneys. Um, of course, the elimination, uh, oftentimes drugs are not eliminated in their parent form. It's some other metabolite or metabolites that are eliminated, uh, typically by the kidneys. There, there are a few exceptions here and there, but that's the, that's the, the main thing that happens with virtually all drugs we give. Uh, nitride is the same as well. And we'll talk about cyanide toxicity in a little more detail um, when we get into our toxicology because we actually have very effective drugs and they are very effective drugs in our scope of practice um, that we could carry if, if we ever did, but nobody seems to. So. But um, we'll get there. Okay. Um, I'm not really going to have you guys memorize how to mix it, how to run it. Um, these tend not to be drips that you guys are going to run into as a, as a, as an entry level paramedic. Um, if you end up, uh, end up on a flight team or a critical care transport, you will run into these, these medications more often and you'll have more experience with mixing and all that. But, um, it's nothing that I'm going to make you memorize. Um, okay, let's now talk about uh, going back to in STEMI, unstable angina, STEMI, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, I think you guys are relatively familiar with, with, uh, with oxygen and when we give it, when we don't. What are some of the pitfalls of giving it, um, particularly when it's not necessarily indicated. Um, let's talk quickly about aspirin. How does aspirin work? Well, yes, um, it, it's not what we would say a, a traditional anticoagulant. So a traditional anticoagulant tends to work in the clotting cascade, and it tends to, uh, they tend to inhibit certain clotting factors, but aspirin is a little different in its mechanism of action, so we don't we don't tend to call it a, a traditional anticoagulant, um, although the lay, the lay public may very well consider an anticoagulant or a quote-unquote blood thinner, um, which is just kind of a, a bourgeoisie term for 
for all of these substances that prove <coughs> clotting or coagulation. But aspirin does it a little uniquely. And I thought I'd just throw that out there and ask you, how, how does aspirin work, first of all? Doesn't it make your blood slippery? No. no. Well, th there is an analogy that might you, you, could, you could use, um, but I want to be just a little more specific. So what class of drugs do, does it, as aspirin belong to? Well, it is a, it is a salicylate, but um, I'm talking general class of drugs. Say it again. There you go. It's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, um, an NSAID. So aspirin has a similar mechanism of action uh, to things like uh, ibuprofen and the toradol or the toralock. So NSAIDs in general, their mechanism of action is generally generally revolves around inhibition of enzymes. Okay, specifically in inhibition of the cyclooxygenase enzyme. And maybe I'll just draw a picture here real quick. Um, so you have a substance called arachidonic arachidonic acid that's found in the cell membrane. And this arachidonic acid can enter a couple of different pathways, a couple of different metabolic or biotransformation pathways. Um, and these, these two pathways have different enzymes. The first pathway has um, what are called cyclooxygenase, or we just say COX. That means cyclooxygenase, and okay, that's the shorthand term. So you have your cyclooxygenase um, enzymes. All right. And we also have another pathway, and I'm not really going to talk about that enzyme because it's not really relevant here, but in respiratory we talk about asthma and, and, and reactive airway disease and airway inflammation. Um, that particular enzyme becomes a lot more important. Um, and you actually have two flavors of the COX enzyme. You have the COX-1 and you have the COX-2 enzyme. And then these COX-1 and 2 enzymes facilitate the biotransformation of this arachidonic acid into a prostaglandins. And you guys don't have to memorize all this stuff word for word, okay? Don't, don't try to focus on memorizing. This is just to help you understand a little more. All right. So um, the types of prostaglandins that go through the COX-1 pathway are the, are the ones that we're most interested in. Okay, these, these prostaglandins are involved not only in infl inflammation and in pain, but they're also involved in things like the manufacturing of our stomach lining. And they're also involved in how platelets aggregate. We call platelet aggregation, and that is activation of the platelets and what causes the platelets to kind of stick to each other and initiate the clotting cascade, initiate the, um, uh, the, uh, the both extrinsic and intrinsic pathways. Of course, they all go to the common pathway. So if I give an NSAID that blocks the COX enzyme, and aspirin happens to block both COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes, so it blocks them all, you prevent the production of the, the types of prostaglandins that are involved in making platelets kind of clump together. But because aspirin is so nonspecific, it blocks a lot of other enzymes that are involved in making the lining of your stomach, for example. And so what is a risk for people that take aspirin, particularly people that take it over a long period of time? There you go, ulcers. Now, yeah. and hopefully it makes sense now because there are prostaglandins that are involved in secreting a, a, that mucus, that mucus lining. Um, so that's how aspirin, that's how insets in general work. And as you guys are aware, there there is a a slightly newer. It's not as new now. Um, they were really new when I was in nursing school. A class of drugs called the COX-2 inhibitors. You ever, um, you guys are, they're, 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 they still have TV ads of, uh, of these. They're called the COX-2 inhibitors. And the COX-2 inhibitors, 
include things. Well, I'll ask you guys. What have you? What, what are some names that maybe you've heard of of a Cox two inhibitor? Um, how about Celebrex? Have you heard of that? Celebrex and Celexa. Celebrex and Celexa are medications that are designed not to inhibit the COX-1 enzyme, so um, they tend to be a little safer on the stomach. So if you have someone that maybe has chronic pain, um, you might want to put them on a COX-2 inhibitor, if they're going to be on it for years and years, um, because the risk of GI complications is lower. But now what are we finding out about the COX-2 inhibitors? What are we finding out there? What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. You've heard this, sir. We're actually finding um, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So people that are put, being put on COX-2 inhibitors may be at higher risk for strokes, MIs, things of that nature. So, you know, there are a lot of considerations there. So that's how aspirin works. Okay, that's how NSAIDs in general work. Um, interestingly enough, other NSAIDs are actually not in our scope of practice in New Mexico. So it's kind of odd. We can give amiodarone and procainamide, which we will talk about here in a little bit, which are highly pro-arrhythmogenic, a little dangerous in a lot of cases, right? These are real dangerous drugs, um, but we you know, can't give medications that a lot of people take over the counter. Just the nuances of of uh, medicine. And so it just works right there where you have the aspirin? Yeah, it works on the cox. Um, one, one and two? One and two. Oh. Aspirin doesn't really care. It's pretty non specific. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it's pretty non specific. The other enzyme, just for the sake of completion, is known as cyclo, or uh, this is a cyclooxygen enzyme. This is known as the lipooxygenase enzyme here. And and that, that actually produces um, what are called leukotrienes, and they're more in, in, involved in inflammation of the lungs, bronchospasm, those kinds of things. And so you, got, you guys have heard, maybe heard of leukotriene inhibitors? They're, they inhibit the production of leukotrienes, and we give them to people that have like asthma, reactive airway disease, allergies, um, and they prevent, they, they help prevent Asthma attacks, allergy attacks, things like that. What would an example? They're not. They're not even relevant. We're not, I'm, I'll talk to. The, I'll talk more about that when we get into um, respiratory. Um, but I just for sake of completion, I just wanted to throw that out there. But I don't want to inundate you guys too much since it's completely irrelevant to what we're going to talk about today. Okay. Um, so you guys good? Good so far, more or less. All right. Cool. <laughs> So let's go ahead and talk about the more classic anticoagulants. So the anticoagulants, they don't work on COX enzymes like aspirin, but rather they work on clotting factors in the clotting cascade. So the classic example of an anticoagulant or a blood thinner is a medication known as heparin. You guys are probably very familiar with this. Or you've heard of it, at least. Heparin. Heparin is commonly administered to people experiencing acute coronary syndromes, but it falls into that, if you look at your cards, it falls into that adjunctive therapies box toward the bottom. So heparin comes after Mona, after you've done those initial things that you need to do, and um, you're looking at sending that patient to the cath lab, for example, you can start that heparin. And why would we want to give somebody experiencing acute coronary syndrome some sort of anticoagulant? What would be the, the rationale for doing that? So you don't want to clot. Okay, to prevent clot. Much the same reason that we give aspirin. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you can give somebody aspirin and anticoagulants together because they work different areas. You know, aspirin here, anticoagulants on clotting factors. Heparin is kind of the old school one. Um, so I will just talk about the dose. Um, I will, I'll be quite honest, I really am not going to expect you guys to memorize all the doses I'm going to cover today, <laughs> but at least I want to cover it just, just so that we've, we've talked about it. I would expect that if you're out in the field and you have to hang a heparin drip, what are you really going to do? 
you know, look it up, right? And you know, pull your book out and you're, you're, yeah, that's what you're going to do. But let's talk about it anyway. So the standard dose of heparin is, in, in an adult patient, is 60 units per kilogram. So heparin is one of those medications like vasopressin that, that, that comes in units as opposed to milligrams, micrograms, milliequivalents. So 60 units per kilogram IV push. So maybe I'll just write that there, heparin. Right. So you in, uh, well we'll get there. So it's 60 units per kilogram IV push. All right. So that's step one. And the maximum dose is about 4,000 units. That's your maximum dose. Some people will give up the 5,000, but generally speaking, 4,000 units is your maximum dose. Okay. So if you, if you calculate, you do your calculation and it's like 8,000 because you've got a large patient, you, you'd only give them four. Does that kind of make sense? So you give them a bolus of heparin. And then, as, as somebody mentioned behind me, um, you follow that up with a drip. So you bolus them, you follow it up with a drip. The drip is, about, uh, is going to be about 12 units per kilogram per hour. per kilogram per hour. And the maximum dose that you would give that patient is 1,000 units per hour. All right. You guys okay with that? So you give them a bolus, you follow it up with a drip. Okay. And you might need to titrate that drip up, and you might need to titrate it down. And one of the big things, there is a lab test that we need to monitor if they're on heparin. Okay, because we need to see how anticoagulated they are. And that lab test that you have to look at is something known as the APTT. Most people just call it the PTT. Have you guys ever heard of that before? That's a lab that you're going to want to know. Not necessarily the normal value, but you're going to want to know what this lab is in general. It is a measure of how your blood clots, okay? And this particular one is known as the partial thromboplastin time, or the activated partial thromboplastin time, okay? And when the lab draws it, the lab has their own normal reference range. It's generally in seconds, okay, how many seconds it takes. And when we have somebody on heparin, we want their PTT a little elevated. We want it higher than normal. And you titrate your drip and you shoot for 1.5 to 2 times the normal partial thromboplastin time. So 1.5 to 2 times the normal. And all of your labs will have, tend to have slightly different ranges. So I, I, why make you memorize what's normal? Because it varies a little bit. 1.5 to 2 times the normal. If it's larger than two times, you probably want to back off on your heparin drip, okay? Um, if it's not within that 1.5 to 2, you may want to increase it a little bit. That kind of makes sense. So you, you, there's a little wiggle room there um, up to that max of 1,000 units per hour, of course. Now, um, with heparin, there's a risk of, of overdose. And actually, we've seen lots of overdoses of heparin, particularly on kids particularly on kids, um, because heparin comes in different concentrations, and they're really highly concentrated, like 5,000 units per milliliter concentrations. And there have been several more recent cases where the nurse pulled a vial of like 5,000 units per milliliter and thought that they were using like 100 units per milliliter. Um, and they gave, you know, one, two, three milliliters of this to a baby. And massive overdose of heparin, and, and, and there were ad, adverse outcomes, include deaths in, in some cases. Um, it was a, a, an actor, was a, a rather famous, I think Dennis Quaid, um, a couple of years ago, his, his, his wife he and his wife had a couple babies, and they were in ICU for, what, for, for reasons I don't, I don't remember, and they ended up getting overdosed on heparin. Um, they ended up surviving, but that was, he actually, one of the things that you he did publicly was this, you know, campaign to try to prevent these, these kinds of errors. 
that then it can pretty easily happen. If a patient gets overdosed on heparin, what do you imagine the, the, the life-threatening problem is there? No <clears throat> Bleeding, yeah. Yeah. Um, there is an antidote, and you're going to want to know this, okay? You're going to want to know what the antidote for heparin overdose is, and it's an antidote called protamine. Protamine sulfate. Protamine sulfate can be used to reverse heparin. So if you have heparin toxicity, you can administer protamine sulfate. Um, another thing to note, it, note about heparin, about 10 to 15% of every patient that will ever get heparin will develop something known as HIT. What percent was that? HIT, oh, about 10% or so. There, yeah, thereabouts. And HIT stands for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. What is thrombocytopenia? What's penia? What does penia mean? Penia. Yeah, low. So, yeah, penia means a deficiency, and cytosis is a abundance of cells. So penia means a deficiency of cells, cytosis means an abundance. And thrombocytes are also known as platelets. So thrombocytopenia is a low platelet count. Okay, can cause a low platelet count in about, about 10 10 percent of people that'll get it. Um, there are many other reasons for giving heparin. People that have central lines, for example, we will often give heparin to them in their central line to prevent blood clots from forming. Um, so we see that uh, people that have implanted ports, like porticaths or um, chemotherapy and those kinds of things, um, will get heparin as well to prevent the ports from clogging up. So heparin actually has many other uses other than just acute coronary syndromes, um, but this tends to be where it's at for us, at least. Um, although we do transport a lot of patients that have central lines and access ports and things like that in place. Now there is another type of heparin that is very common and many, most people that end up in the hospital for more than, that end up admitted will get this kind of heparin. And this is a fractionated heparin, um, or something known as low molecular weight heparin. And it's low molecular weight heparin, or LMHW. And the common one that we run into in the United States is something known as Lovenox. Lovenox or anoxaprine, I believe, is the generic for that. Anyone here been in the hospital for more than a couple days? No? You guys are all pretty young, healthy people for the most part, huh? Um, we tend to, people that get admitted to the hospital, what are they doing when they're in the hospital if they're sick? Yeah, they're not doing much anything, are they? They're lying down, and what are they at risk for if they're not moving and lying down? Thrombosis. Say it again? Thrombosis. Yeah, they're at risk for something known as a DVT, which is actually something we'll talk about um, tomorrow, deep vein thrombosis. Generally, they tend to develop back here in the leg, and if they break free, what can they cause? Like pulmonary emboli, right? Yeah, DVTs cause pulmonary emboli. Um, or a big cause of pulmonary emboli. So we will give this low molecular weight heparin to patients to prevent DVTs from forming and to prevent pulmonary emboli. Um, low molecular weight heparin is not given IV like heparin, but rather it is given subcutaneously, generally in the abdomen. Generally that's where we see it given subcutaneously in the abdomen. and it, It's generally just a once a day thing, once every 12 or 24 hours. Um, they'll get it generally something like a milligram per kilogram. You don't have to memorize the dose. Okay. But you just have to know that lo low molecular weight heparin, a lobinox or noxaprine, is used generally as a DVT prophylaxis. That's what we run into it. Okay, um, moving right along, there are a couple of medications that we don't give, but you guys have got to be aware of it. Okay, you've got to be aware of them because a lot of your 
your patients with cardiac disease go home on these medications, particularly if they've had stents placed, okay, um, or other things, valve replaced, valve, valves replaced, or if they're in atrial fibrillation. The first of those is something known as Coumadin. You guys familiar with Coumadin? Coumadin or Warfarin. Coumadin is a little different from heparin. It does work on a clotting factor. It does not work on the same clotting factors as heparin. Um, consequently, do, do anticoagulants break clots down? No, they just prevent the formation of clots. So they don't break down uh, clots that are already in existence. Coumadin or Warfarin works on vitamin K. And we know that vitamin K is a clotting factor, and, they, and it prevents the utilization of vitamin K, and that can cause anticoagulation. The good thing about Coumadin is people can take it as a pill. It's orally active. You can take it. You can go home. You don't need to be in the hospital. The bad thing about Coumadin, though, is what? It makes you bleed, right? And, and it interacts with a lot of things, unfortunately. Coumadin has it, multiple interactions, multiple interactions. Um, even worse than that, it has multiple interactions with so-called uh, natural or homeopathic kinds of things. So herbs, supplements, those kinds of things. Um, a lot of those things will interact with, with, with Coumadin. So the risk for Coumadin toxicity is exceptionally high. Uh, generally, people on Coumadin have to have regular blood draws. In, in fact, it's such a common thing when you guys go to uh, a Memorial Medical Center, um, next to, the, there's a little break room there in the main, in the main area. It's just, just down the hall from the, uh, uh, the, the little store there, little gift shop. Um, and it's called the Coumadin Clinic. And it's a special little area where people on Coumadin can go and get their blood drawn. That's just how relevant uh, that is. If we run into an issue where we have toxicity, first of all, um, before I get there, there is a lab that we monitor for Coumadin to see how effective it is. And I always remember it's PTT for heparin, and it's PT, I didn't put Coumadin, but it is the PT, the prothrombin time, okay, that we measure for Coumadin. So partial thromboplastin time for heparin, prothrombin time for Coumadin. Generally, we'd like to draw these together as part of a coagulation profile. Um, the PTT, PT, and then something called the INR, the International Normalized Ratio. Um, those three tend to be the real common um, lab tests that we do for clotting. Now, um, is there an antidote for Coumadin toxicity or warfarin toxicity? Is there an antidote for that? There actually is. There is. There are two antidotes, two things that will work. The first is simply administering vitamin K. Administering vitamin K is something called aquamethitin. Uh, vitamin K. And the other thing that will work, and actually this will work for heparin to, to an extent as well, is giving your patient pure clotting factors. And how could I inject, clot? What, what would be a good way of getting pure clotting factors in my patient? Is there some medication or product that I can give? Blood product. The blood product, specifically plasma. FFP, fresh frozen <coughs> plasma. FFP is a good way of replacing clotting factors, yeah, fresh frozen plasma. Um, incidentally, Coumadin is a very common uh, substance in certain poisons, rat poison, yeah. Yeah. Uh, rat poison, yeah, rats eat the pellets, pellets contain large doses of Coumadin, the rats bleed out and die. Uh, 
In fact, it's, it's interesting, we actually have seen some, some um, evolution occur in rats, and we're seeing rats um, that are becoming more resilient to Coumadin, and we've actually had to develop other drugs of, that are collectively known as super warfarin or super Coumadin um, to put in, in rat poison to, to take these more resilient rats out. Um, there are uh, some newer agents that are um, hitting the market, and I'm actually going to have you guys research some names um, um, through Canvas of these newer agents. But these newer agents do not have the interactions that Coumadin have, so that's nice. Um, and these newer agents do not require blood draws, uh, which is really nice, huh? It's convenient. But here's the problem with these newer agents. There are no reversal agents for them. So if you have an overdose, we don't have effective ways of managing patients that overdose on these newer, these newer um, anticoagulants. Some of them have long half-lives, right? Uh, they can, yeah. Um, so there's some good and bad there, but I'll have you guys research the names of these because these are becoming very popular. Um, we actually had a student last year, a uh, firefighter who um, had see. He sprained his ankle um, at work and ended up developing a DVT and they put him on one of these newer agents. He was on it for like six months or a year. I mean, basically a significant part of, uh, uh, of his schooling, he was on this, this, this agent. He did okay though, but still it's, it's interesting. So we're, we're seeing these, these newer drugs out. Um, and uh, like I said, I'll have you guys research the names of them because you'll want to be able to recognize them on a, a drug list. Guys, doing okay so far? Am I? I'm not like just totally doing yeah, doing stuff that just totally doesn't make sense. You guys, more or less. Okay, cool. Um, one more drug that I want to talk about. Uh, two more drug, uh, a drug and a drug class. I'll just briefly talk about them, and then we can actually get into talking about anti dysrhythmics and anti hypertensives. Um, there um, is uh, another medication that's very common. It's called Plavix. Are you guys familiar with that? Plavix. Okay. Plavix is, is sort of similar to aspirin. It is not an inset, but it does prevent platelet aggregation like aspirin, only it, it, its mechanism is very different. It is not use, it's not a prostaglandin mechanism. Um, Plavix um, or... Is that enoxaprin? Um, you know, you'll have to double check me on the other name. Plavix is the common name we see. Plavix is a very common drug uh, that we see given to patients after they have had stents placed or they've had PCI. Um, they have a stent in place. Um, not uncommon. And as you might guess, what what are you more concerned about with Plavix? Somebody's on it. What's what's the most concerning thing at our, at our level, really. There you go, clotting. Bleeding, right? That's really the main thing that we're concerned about with all of these. Um, and then finally, there is one more class of agent that I want you guys to be familiar with. And these are the glycoprotein inhibitors, okay? Um, and they're actually specific glycoproteins. And glycoproteins are... Um, proteins that have a sugar-like group attached to them, and these proteins are located on the surfaces of cells or cell fragments. And the subtypes of glycoproteins that we're worried about are glycoproteins on the surfaces of platelets. And these glycoprotein inhibitors inhibit the action of those glycoproteins on platelets, and they prevent the platelets from aggregating and forming a clot. So it is sort of like aspirin in that it prevents platelets from working, but it does it through a mechanism that is completely different from aspirin. Um, it's uh, working on glycoproteins versus aspirin, working on, on an enzyme. You guys okay with that? These glycoprotein inhibitors are generally given to patients that are having unstable angina or in non stemmies Okay, that t tends to be the patient group that we see these glycoprotein inhibitors being given to. Um, the two ones that are commonly used in the United States are um, Integralin or Agrostat. Um, 
Those are the two ones that we run into, Integralin and Agrostat. Um, they're both, uh, I believe, let's see, Integralin for sure is a, you give a bolus, kind of like heparin, it's a weight-based bolus, and then it's a weight-based infusion. Um, I don't want you to worry about memorizing doses or any of that, okay? Because um, you look it up if you had to run an Integralin drip or an Agrostat drip. But that's what the glycoprotein inhibitors, Integralin and Agrostat, are, are primarily used for. Um, acute coronary syndromes, adjunctive therapy, and really all of this, the heparin, um, the heparin drip, the glycoprotein inhibitor infusions, these are all fall into that more adjunctive therapy stuff that um, generally occurs before, during, or maybe after your patient has their intervention, um, and occasionally during transport. Okay, you guys good there? Okay, so we got through all of that good stuff. Um, I'm going to let you guys out a little early, and I'll give you 10 minutes, uh, so come back just, just before 10. Um, I don't want to start in on a new subject without giving you guys a little break, because this next subject can get a little, a little intense to understand what's going on, so I want to give you guys a little break. Sure. All right. Are you guys doing okay? Any? Okay, cool.